what a day you called my name and I Restroom this morning. It says to me, I needed rest. The sin was heavy. The chains break out the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now you Make some noise from this morning. Come on, lift up and shout. Treasures that fade are never enough. No, they're not. And you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. There's nothing. Come on. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Not afraid. Come on. I'm not afraid. Show you my weakness. I fail yours and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Yeah. There's not a place where your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing hey, better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Yeah. Nothing is better than you. No, there's not. Oh, there's nothing. Better than you. 
in worship. We are thankful they're here. We're thankful that Matt Bartik is going to speak to us today. Let me tell you just a little bit about Matt. And I know Matt awfully well, but I won't tell you all of those stories. Matt was born and raised in the St. Louis area. He's a 1977 graduate of Hannibal LaGrange. I came to know him in, in 1997. <laughs> I came to know him in 1992. Let me read this instead of tell you. In 1997, he graduated from Hannibal Grange with a degree in education. While a student at Hannibal Grange, he was a pitcher on the baseball team. He served in, in, uh, as an RA. He also was a member of the Praise Song Traveling Ensemble. After graduating, he served at Hannibal Grange as an admission rep for a while as well. And then he went on to Midwestern Seminary where he received a master's degree in religious education. Matt has served some of the mega churches in America, in Texas, in Florida, for over 20 years and had the opportunity to work in congregations other than that all over America as well and has had a large impact, over 30,000 people in those churches. Seven years ago, he came home to the Troy Moscow Mills area and started, founded, and now pastors, and good things well, North Road Church. And it has grown and grown and grown and now has a second campus in Harveston, Missouri. Matt's passion is in faith walking, in faith talking, taking huge risks for the gospel, and he does that, and we appreciate that so much. And he will, and because of that, lives will be changed, and we believe in that, and we're praying that lives will be changed through this ministry even this morning. Right now, Matt serves as a trustee at Hannibal LaGrange University, so he helps make, the, make decisions for our institution. Matt's married to Betsy, who is also 
a graduate of Hannibal Grange, and I believe has five children, one of them here today. Yes, Micah is here today as well. So we're happy about that. After the North Road uh, worship team leads us again, Matt will come and speak to you. Thank you. Please be seated. I'll veto that if that's cool. Yeah, let's let's keep standing. Let's do one more song here. We'll sing of the goodness of God this morning. For what he's done for us. Sing with us. Sing this good one.
Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? It is good to see you guys. I hope you enjoyed worship. I just want you to know, my name is Matt, and I know that he said I'm a 1977 graduate. I leaned over to him. I said, dude, I know I look old, but I'm not quite there yet. Anyway, um, I'm really humbled to be here with you guys today. I did graduate in 1997, started in 1985. No, I'm kidding. 1992, I was on the five-year plan. Anybody else? I was on the five-year plan. And um, I am just extremely humbled to be here. Humbled for a couple reasons. As I listened to, to, uh, to Faith sing this morning, something came into my mind, and this is what came into my mind, is that God is so graceful. And it almost gets me a little uh, emotional. Because I think of the person that I was. And I think about how in the middle of that, God is so graceful. And so many times, he allows us to not experience the full brunt of our choices. And I thought about how graceful he was to me. Because I was, I'm just being honest with you, I spent some crazy years here. Trying to follow God with my whole heart and at the same time, making choices that I wish sometimes I could take back. And the reason I come today is because I want you to see the gravity of your choices. I want you to realize that in these next four to six years, however long it takes you to get out of here, I did have one guy in my class that was on the 11-year plan. You remember, Brad? Um, that, that happens, and if you are, Hannibal LaGrange thanks you. You've made them very wealthy. Anyway, but at the end of the day, um, you know, those four to six years, do you realize that in your life you will make the most long-lasting decisions that you'll ever make again? You don't make those kinds of decisions when you're seven. You don't make those kinds of decisions when you're 77 or even 45. You will make decisions in the next four to six years that will mark the rest of your life. Who you choose for a wife or a husband, that is going to last you hopefully years. What you're going to do for a profession, that's probably going to last you for years. Where you choose to move when you get done living here is going to last most likely for a long time. And I just hope that you're taking the time to think through every decision you make. Because the decisions, not only those, but the decisions you make in this time mark you more than any other decisions you're going to make in your life. And I was reading about decisions that college students are making right now, and I just want to read you a couple. Can I do that? 33% of students that are in college right now will walk out with so much credit card debt that they will be absolutely crippled. Three out of ten girls will get pregnant. Close to 700,000, this, this was mind-boggling to me, close to 700,000 students between the ages of 20 and 24 will get assaulted by someone in college because the person they were with was drunk. 150,000 students will become future alcoholics because of the drinking that they learned in college. 54% of all STDs diagnosed in 2016 were in your age group. 54%. 76.5% of all college students have used internet pornography. And in 2018, the website Pornhub reported that 61% of its users were in your age group. Now think about that. This isn't health class right? I'm not here to shoot statistics at you. What I'm here to shoot at you is this, is that your decisions really matter. And what I want to show you through scripture today is not only do your decisions really matter, but they will affect you for a very, very long time. I got on Reddit. I didn't get on Reddit. I got on Google and I, and I saw that people on Reddit were asked, what is the most permanent life decision that you've ever made? And here are some of the answers. I got my girlfriend's name tattooed on my calf in a fairly large, bold black letters. She's now my sister-in-law. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. I broke up with the most awesome girl in, in college because I wasn't ready to settle down and I've been trying to find that same awesome girl ever since or someone even remotely close and it's impossible. I started smoking in, in college and I've done irreversible damage to my body for no other reason than to get a nicotine fix for a problem I created for myself. I was stupid. I quit two years ago and still I think about it every single day even though I know better. Here's one for you. I inherited $600,000 in college from my grandpa when I was 18 years old. I wanted to invest in the stock market, but instead I actually ended up buying drugs and gambling. I bought a BMW. I, I lived the club lifestyle. I, broke, uh, I was broke by 22, 
And now at 26, I hate myself. At least I could have, at least I could have done is help my grandma or my mom out with money while I still had it. But I didn't even do that. I was such an idiot. Here's, <laughs> this is the worst one. I decided when I was in college that I was going to be an expert at parkour. Anybody in here? But my bad coordination didn't kill that motivation. Until one evening, I was at the local park, and I decided to do a massive wall jump that failed epically. I fell on top of a jagged surface and tore out my intestines. Due to this injury, I now have a permanent colostomy bag for the rest of my life. Do you, are, you, are you seeing the, the, the pattern here? That your choices matter. That what you do makes a difference. And we walk in sing, every single day, and we make hundreds, if not thousands, of choices every single day. And one of them will mark you. If you're not careful, if you got your Bibles, I want you to do me a favor and go to the book of first Kings. And we're going to read an incredibly familiar story. And we're only going to read the very first part of it. And we're actually going to read the part that you've always heard. And then we're going to talk about the fallout from it. Do you guys know what the word fallout means? I have a definition for you here up on the screen. If they'll put that up there for me. Fallout is the adverse side effects or results of a situation. Let me, let me explain something to you. In every single day of your life, there are fallout to the choices that you make. Today, you will have fallout to that, right? You'll do something today, and there, whether good or whether bad, you are going to experience fallout. And what we're going to learn in the scriptures today is how fallout can have catastrophic consequences on our life. If, if you know the book of 2 Samuel, you know a lot of it's written about David. David is one of the most popular guys in the, the book of the Bible, in any book of the Bible, in the Bible and in religious history. And what you'll find about him is this. God said he was a man after his own heart. God said, if you want to find somebody on earth that looks the most like me, go find David. I said, no, I'm saying Daniel. Go see David, and David is the one that reminds you most of me. Have you ever read the story of 2 Samuel chapter 11? The man who loved God more than anybody? Let's read it together. If you got your Bibles, I want you to do me a favor and go to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. And I'll read it for you if you can read it on the screen. Awesome. If you can, I'll read it to you. In the spring of the year, at a time when kings go off to battle, David sent Joab instead. He sent his servants with him and all of Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites, they besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. I want to hold on to that thought for just a second. In the springtime of the year, at a time when it's natural for kings to go out to war. In other words, it is just what kings do in the spring of the year. They go out to war and they, and they, and they fulfill their destiny that, that God has called them to do. He decided to take a playoff and stay home. There's a choice. What's the fallout going to be? Now think about the simplicity of that choice. It's not a big choice. He slept in. How many of you guys have slept in from class? I mean, I won't go there. Anyway, I ha it happened late one afternoon. David slept in from class. When David arose from his couch, walked up on the roof of the king's house, and he saw this woman who was bathing. She was incredibly beautiful. Now David sent to his people, and, they, and he inquired about the woman. And one of them said, hey, dude, I know you're the king, but isn't that Bathsheba? And doesn't she belong to Uriah the Hittite? I mean, do you know what you're doing, man? And look what it says next. Here comes the next choice. Wonder what the fallout's going to be. So David sent messengers and took her anyway. And she came to him and he laid down with her. Now she had been purifying herself from uncleanness. And then she returned to her house and the woman conceived and she sent and told David, uh-oh, I'm one of the three out of ten. And all of a sudden, his whole life is starting to change. Fallout, fallout, fallout. So David sent word to Joab, his buddy, who's on the front lines, and he said, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David, and when Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing, or yeah, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing, how the war was going, and then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet, man, hang out with your wife, and maybe you'll get her pregnant. <laughs> Please go get her pregnant. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present with the, from the king. Now, if you're Uriah in this moment, aren't you kind of going, what's up with the king? I mean, he's never talked to me before in my entire life, and all of a sudden he wants to be my best buddy. He calls me home from war. He gives me gifts. He goes me to go home and hang out with my wife. Something had to be clicking in Uriah's mind, right? 
And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and would not go down to his house. And when they told David Uriah didn't go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in Booth, and my lord's Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife as you live and as your souls li- our souls live? I will not do this. And then David said to Uriah, you remain here also today, and tomorrow I'm going to send you back. And so Uriah remains in Jerusalem, and David invited him, and he ate in the presence and drank so that he got really drunk. So David's going, if I get him just trash drunk, maybe then he'll go home and do what he's supposed to do so that I can get out of my trouble. So are you seeing the fallout? Now not only is David, okay, making poor choices on his own and ruining the life of a lady named Bathsheba, but now he's getting her husband drunk and making him, trying to get him to make bad decisions. David invited him in his presence, and he drank, and he had him drunk. And then in the evening, he went to lie on his couch in the servants of the Lord, but he did not go down to his house. Uriah would not do what he felt wasn't right. And in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to your, uh, in the hand of Uriah. How would you like to carry your own death sentence? And in that letter, he said, set Uriah at the front, in the middle of the heart of spying, fighting. And then everybody stepped back. He met Uriah, let's go get him. Where did everybody go? And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew violent men would be, or valiant men. And the men of the city came out and they fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell, and Uriah the Hittite died. Now, that's where this story usually ends, right? Do you ever, do you ever hear any more of this story? When we hear David and Bathsheba, don't we? We might hear a little bit more. I'm sorry. We'll hear about when Nathan comes to him and says, dude, you did the wrong thing. You shouldn't have done that. And, and, and you remember David prays because he's going to lose his child because Nathan tells him you're going to lose your child. And David prays and the child dies anyway. And usually when you're in the church service, that's where it stops. And, and, and if we don't know the Bible really well, we would go, well, there's the end of the fallout. But it's so far from the end. Because do you know what happened? David began to continue to live life. He actually had a son who was the wisest person in the world that ever lived. His name was Solomon, and he was the son of Bathsheba. So some good came out of his choice, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But a few years later, he had a son named Amnon. You ever heard of Amnon? Amnon thought his sister Tamar was hot. Funny, but kind of sick, right? You see, Amnon struggled with the same sins his dad did. You see, fallout doesn't just affect you, it affects who's going to come after you. And some of you, you know this to be true because you are the exact representation of your family and it scares you to death. You're broken and you're hurt and you're wounded because of what you've experienced at home. Amnon was broken and wounded with what he experienced at home. He'd watch his dad be a sexual predator for lack of a better term, you're like, oh, how can you call David that? I mean, he was the man after God's own heart. At points, he was. He's also a rapist. He's also a murderer. And as Amnon watched the sexual promiscuity of his dad, he decided he needed to have his sister, and he raped her. Fallout. She had a brother named Absalom. Now, Absalom was this valiant, fighting dude. And when he found out that Amnon had done that to Tamar, he went to his dad. And he said, Dad, can you believe that Amnon raped Tamar? And you know what the Bible says? I wish I had time to just go verse by verse with you. I just don't. But do you know what the Bible says there? David got really angry. Where's the rest? David got really angry and he went and took care of Amnon. Doesn't doesn't say that. It just says David got angry. Why did David not take care of Amnon? Because he made the same choices. And how do you stand in the face of your son and go, how dare you be such a sexual predator? When he was the exact same thing. Fallout. When Absalom found out that his dad wouldn't take care of Amnon, you know what Absalom did? He got all his brothers together and he murdered his brother right in front of his family. And his dad was incredibly angry, again. And you know what he did? He cast Absalom out. 
He wouldn't let him be inside the castle for almost two years. And isn't it funny that a dad who would just get angry at a son for raping his daughter would cast another son out because he killed his brother who raped his daughter? Now, why would he choose to, ch to handle one this way and the other this way? Here's why. Because this is his sin struggle. He understands it. Murder, he does not understand. At least, not firsthand anyway. Because he never saw himself as a murderer. He saw Joab as a murderer. And again, I say fallout. And Absalom, when he realized his dad didn't love him like he thought he did, or he felt like he was unfair, or he felt like he was hypocritical, or he looked at his dad and he goes, Dad, how can you say these things? I mean, you, you, you took Bathsheba and you raped her. I mean, come on, you watched Tamar get raped. You're, you're such a monster of a man that he decided he needed to take over half the kingdom. And he did. And David finds himself running for his life from his own son. He finds himself... <laughs> in the middle of a war with his own son. And one of his guys comes back to him and says, the war's over, we just killed your boy. And I want you to look at the fallout of but one choice. Can you put that up there for me? David rapes Bathsheba. David then has Uriah killed by Joab. Nathan rebukes David. Tells him his son's going to die, and David's son dies. Amnon rapes Tamar. David weakly ignores Tamar's rape. Absalom kills Amnon because of it. Absalom takes over half the kingdom, and Absalom is killed. And I want you to read with me what David said when he found out Absalom was dead. Verse 33. And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over his gate. I want, you to, I want you to see this picture, okay? I just want to paint this for you. He's, he's looking over the top of the city, over his gate, and he's thinking about his life. He's thinking about the moments when he didn't kill his thousands, but he kills his tens of thousands. He's thinking about the victories over Goliath. He's thinking about all the wars that he won. He's thinking of all the respect he had. And then, boom, it just shoots to that one choice when he should have went to war. And he didn't. Now his family's a train wreck, an absolute train wreck. Now I want you to notice some things about this. Will you just really with, with, with me real quick? We always think, I don't know how somebody would make a choice like that. Who would rape somebody? Who would kill somebody? Who would allow somebody to be killed? Who wouldn't talk to their kid about their sexual issues? We think that, don't we? But is that how it began? No. You know how it began? All David did was hit the snooze bar. Walked up on his roof. And there was the rest of his life. Hmm. Decisions matter. Where you place yourself matters. Who you hang with matters. The things you do in the morning matters. The things that you look at with your eyes matter. Because you think that you can handle it yourself. But you just don't know the day that your decisions will cost you everything. I, do you remember that movie, or have you seen that movie that's coming out again? It came out when I was in college. It was called Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And it's these, like, pothead type dudes are like dude we found a time machine you know you know the one i'm talking about and they go back in time to all these different places i wish i had a time machine of bill and ted's that i could go back to the castle and i could be in the ear of david and i go dude don't sleep in don't take a play off don't go up on the roof, man. Get on the bus and get on whatever you're riding, the camel or the horse or whatever, and get off to war. Because I'm telling you, if you do this, you're going to rape some dude's wife. You're going to murder her husband. You're going to lose a child at birth. Your daughter's going to get raped. Your son's going to get murdered. Your other son's going to take over half your kingdom. And you're going to have to see him murdered in order to get your kingdom back. You think he'd sleep in? Uh -uh. 
Some of you, you come from broken homes, don't you? Your mom and dads aren't monsters. They just made a bad choice one time. Maybe you come from a home where one of your parents cheated on the other. They're not a monster. They just made a choice that sticks with them for the rest of their life. And what I'm trying to tell you today is you don't know the choices that are going to stick with you for the rest of your life. So be careful of every choice that you make, including your friends. Proverbs 13, 20, I'm going to put it up on the board for you. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the company of a fool suffers harm. Can I tell you what I did in college? I surrounded myself with a bunch of idiots. I had a choice. I could surround myself with people who made great choices, or I could surround myself with people that were a bunch of idiots. You know where idiots take you? To idiot places. Here's a statement for you. You ready? You show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. You show me your friends now, and if you stay with them, I guarantee you in five years, you will see your future played out in your friends. You want to know how I know? Look at the scripture. What happened when Joab comes home from war and David goes, hey man, take Uriah the Hittite and have him killed. Okay. That's a good friend. Great friend right there, isn't it? How about Joab when he said, hey Joab, I'm going to sleep in. And Joab goes, okay. No problem, man. I don't need friends who will let me do what I need to do. I need friends who will lead me towards God. Who will lead me towards decisions that won't wreck my life. Joab should have loved him enough to say, man, get on your camel, we're going to war. Joab should have loved him enough to say, you're not going to kill Uriah the Hittite. What the heck's wrong with you, man? But he didn't love him enough. And some of you, you're walking with people who are going to watch and witness your worst decision you've ever made in your life because you allow them in your life. And I'm going to say something bold in front of your friends that maybe not be good for you. You need to leave them and find somebody who will be the friend that you need. Now, some of you, let's just be honest, you're sitting here like I probably would have said in my freshman year, not my senior year, but my freshman year. And you're like, who is this idiot and what's he talking about? I mean, come on, you're such a moron. Some of you are thinking it. Let me show you a verse that you need to hear. And I pray that you hear it. James 4, 6. God gives more grace to the humble. And actually, that's written wrong. I want to read this, this, this version of it. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let me say that again. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let me say it again. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. I I want you to think about this for just a second, okay? I want you to put this in your mind. God resists. What's it like to be resisted by God? What is it like to have the God of the universe who breathed air into your lungs and mind, who put a planet together in seven days, looked at you and said, I'm going to stop every successful thing in your life because you're too haughty and too proud to listen. So shut your mouth and back up and humble yourself and let me do amazing things through you. Matt Barton came to this campus thing and he was just a guy. And God resists him there. How far is he going to have to resist you? It doesn't have to be that way. Because he gives more grace. Gives more grace if you ask. So here's what I want to challenge you to do today. I want to challenge you what I would go back and say to David. Hey, David, just humble yourself. Just when you wake up in the morning, go, God, I don't have it all figured out. So, God, will you give me the grace and the ability just to make good choices? Because, God, if I do it on my own, I'm going to screw this thing up. Can I tell you something? I sat in a restaurant at 5.30 in the morning the other day, and I wrote a list of all the choices that would happen in my life if I continued down a road of decision-making that I've currently been in. Do you want to know why I did that? Because I don't want to be David. And I want to be humble enough to hear what God has to say so that he can change me. I watched a pastor on Sunday melt down, lose his junk, and walk away from his ministry. And I have to believe it was probably because at times when God was warning him, 
He did. Go to war. Go to war. Go to war. He went. Yeah. And God said, okay, then I got to resist you. Don't let God do that to you. Don't be the next casualty story. Don't be the next divorce story. The next sexually transmitted disease story. The next alcoholic story. Be the next story of falling up. I I want to finish on this, okay? What would have happened if David would have went and said, you know what? I screwed up by going on that rooftop. I need to go back and get on the horse. And he would have not went to the, he would have went halfway up the rooftop and went back down. He wouldn't have done all the other things. What would have happened if he met Bathsheba and raped her and then said, God, I need your forgiveness. I'll take whatever consequence I have. He wouldn't have lost son after son after son. He wouldn't have seen a daughter raped. Anytime you want to, you can fall up. You don't have to fall out. So some of you, you're in the midst of fallout right now. And it is coming unless you start falling up. And the way you do that is, God, I can't make these decisions on my own. So help me walk away from porn. Help me walk away from sleeping with my girlfriend or my boyfriend. God, help me walk away from getting drunk on the weekends. God, help me to be a person of integrity. God, help me walk away from anger. God, help me walk away from anxiety. And when you're encouraged to walk up those steps, get on your knees and say, God, teach me to go to war. And I guarantee you, he loves me enough that he will because he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for David, who's a man after your own heart, God, and I so want to be. But it gives me encouragement, God, to know that I'm not the only screw up in the world. God, as I watch just your grace play out, I'm just amazed. So God, with every person in this room, God, just let us hear you and know you and humbly submit ourselves before you so that, God, we don't make the decision that will mark the rest of our life, our family's lives, our children's lives, and our legacy. In your name I pray.